few weeks ago, Pastor asked me to write an article about um, the power to change lives, an article for, for uh, a newspaper or a magazine close by. And as I started to sit down and read, I started to think of the audience, so the people who would be reading this article. For you see, any good writer knows that you first, in order to write something effective, the purpose of writing is to deliver a message. But in order to be able to deliver a message, you've got to be able to identify with the people to whom you're delivering this message. And so I started to think about the people, the magazines for the Laval families, and I started to think about the people living in this area, and think about what they need, and think about what was it that the Lord would want to tell these people? What would the Lord want these people, this group of people, to know? And I started to think about it, and I started to write, and started to write about uh, everyday people, you know, people just like us, people who have jobs and their families, people who are maybe frustrated in their situation. And I started to think about that theme, the power to change lives. The power to change lives. And I started to think about my own life. And I started to think about how can we convince people that they have the power to change lives. And my mind ran over the uh, woman. I'm sure most of us have heard the story. It's been several months now about the the 17-year-old girl who... Uh, committed suicide in Nova Scotia. Why? Because she was raped and no one stopped to listen to what she had to say. She was raped and not only was she raped, but she, uh, her uh, rapist took pictures and posted them on Facebook. And the law said that because they had no hard and fast evidence, they couldn't press any charges. And so even though there were pictures, there was no proof, so they said, to be able to acquit or to, to prosecute and to, to bring people to justice. And so she carried, uh, she spoke and she was pleading for help. She was seeing counselors and she was looking for help and yet it seemed the help that she needed was nowhere to be found. And so I thought, and I stopped to think, what would I tell her? What would I say to this woman who had been so broken and bruised and not only that, but people were, uh, and now she was being bullied on top of it as, as if it weren't bad enough that she had suffered trauma, but now she's being bullied on top of the trauma that she suffered. I, I started to think, what would I tell this young woman? What would I tell her and the millions and uh, the thousands of uh, of, of of young people, not just young people, but I read an article the other day that says suicide among the elderly now is starting to increase. Yes. Why? Because they feel as if they're hopeless. Yes, right. They feel as if, you know, having lived their lives to a certain point, no one cares for them. Either their, their loved ones uh, show them into a nursing home or their a spouse has died and they, or their kids have moved away. But whatever the case may be, they feel as if nobody cares. Right. Uh, nobody loves them. And so they feel as if the only chance or the only way to alleviate the suffering is to end their life. I think about what I would say to these individuals who have gotten to a place where they feel as if they tried everything else and yet nothing else will do. And I think, do I really have the power to make a difference? Can my words or my actions really make a difference in their life. And so as I start to think about it, I start to think, well, what would Jesus say? You know, I remember if you, uh, I don't know if you remember, but back in the, uh, in the 90s, they had this uh, campaign, if you will, and people would rock around with these bracelets and they say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And you see, it was a fad for a while, and uh, this group uh, spread a message that make people think, what would Jesus do? But as fads do, they come and they go, and messages get lost. But that message resonated with me as I was thinking about these individuals, these souls. What would Jesus do? And I started to pray, I said, Lord, I want to have the mind of Christ, because I want to know how to reach people. You know, my words can't do anything of themselves, but I want to know how I really can have the power to change lives. See, it's one thing to write about something, but something else to believe it. You know, sometimes we're very good about portraying different things, but I wonder if we always believe what it is that we portray. And so I started to think, Lord, how can I, you know, we've been hearing this preaching about getting out of our minds and getting beyond ourselves and really impacting and making it. I said, Lord, how can I get to this place? And so I started to read in Philippians 2 where it says, let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ. And then the writer goes on to describe what it is that Christ did. Right. And so it dawned on me that if I want to understand, if I want to get the mind of Christ like I say I do, then I've got to know who Christ is. Amen. And see, a man is not just known by what he says, but by what he does. You know, people can say whatever they want about themselves. But self-praise is no praise at all because sometimes we have an image of ourselves that's not really true. That's not really realistic. That's not really accurate because we're either trying to cover something up or we're trying to, we don't want some part of us to be exposed and so we create personas. And if you think uh, you're not, you're the only one, trust me, you're not because we all have personas. How do I know? Because, you know, my mother, as I watch her, she could be yelling one minute and yelling at her kids or something she did and she picks up the phone she's like hello like nothing ever happened why because there are certain characteristics or certain characters that we adopt to be able to fit in a situation and those characters have been built because of our training because of our socialization we learned that when you're in school that is the time to sit still and be quiet and listen to the teacher and when you're out on the playground it's the time for you to be loud and rambunctious we learn that there are different characters that are suitable for different situations but the problem with characters is that characters create the situation and situations create the characters. And what I mean by that is the situations that we live and situations that people have experienced have crafted a certain character in them. But it's not always the right character. See, characters are created based on assumptions and based on what we think should be. But the thing is, we don't always get it right. We don't always understand. We don't always know what's happening beyond the surface. So the characters that we create are based on our own perception. But our perception is not reality. Our perception is not reality. For you see, in this text that we read this morning, I'm trying to be quick because I know time is far spent, that reality in this situation is that this man that came to Jesus was full of leprosy. This man that came to him had a very distinct problem. And if you know anything about leprosy, especially in these days, how it was characterized. It was a a dreadful disease. It was a skin-eating disease where that leprosy would come and literally eat away at your skin. And so even from a distance, you could see, you could tell the the signs of leprosy because you'd see that the missing parts of skin and missing parts of flesh from a person is almost as if they were being eaten alive. And so it was something that was putrid to look at. It was something disgusting to look at. It wasn't something that was pleasing, but it was something that would make you want to stay far away. In fact, it was dictated that if anyone had leprosy, they were to yell, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away. That's what society dictated. That's what was supposed to happen. If someone was unclean, if they were leprous, then they should have no contact with anybody else, but they should be ostracized because they're unclean and because we don't want to catch what they have. We don't want to, to defile ourselves and somehow be uh, catch this dreadful disease and, and have that same affliction implant, uh, infect ourselves. We want to remain pure and clean and free of diseases, so it was declared that at this point, those who had leprosy were supposed to stay away. Right. They were to have no contact, no, no, uh, no interaction with them for fear of polluting the rest of society. Very much so in the way that we ostracize people today. Maybe the leprosy is not one of the skin, but it's one of behaviorism where we say, well, those people are not quite right. Society has a way of ostracizing people who don't quite fit into their milieu. We have a way of pushing people to the fringe and saying, listen, you don't quite fit here. Your place is not in the middle of society because you may taint the rest of what uh, of, of what we have going here. We're trying to work on something good. We've got something good going here and you are fighting against it or you are, you, you are going to pollute what we have. In the uh, early eight, in 1900s, there was a campaign that was going where uh, the uh, geneticist Francis Darwin, cousin to Charles Darwin, was trying to encourage governments to practice uh, getting rid or ostracizing people who had low IQs. Yes, 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 yes. But what he was saying was that if these people with low IQs, if they 
infiltrate with the rest of society. They marry and, ha and reproduce and multiply. We'll have other people with high IQs. And that's not where society is trying to go. We're trying to get to a place. We're trying to get beyond. We're trying to get higher. And so we don't want those kinds amongst us. But you see, the first step to tyranny is the us and them principle. See, what Francis Darwin saw when he saw these people of low IQs, he saw something other than what he desired. Right. He saw something that was undesirable, something that he was trying to run away from. See, he was a man of, of upper class society. He was a man of wealth. He was a man who had a desire for great things and a desire to build a society that was reflective of those values. And so when he saw these people of low IQ, people who were dumb or, or who were uh, intellectually challenged, he said, that does not fit. But what he failed to see is that he saw people just like him. People who perhaps instead of being ostracized needed a help up. You see, at the same time, there are studies that are being done that show that these students, PJ with his uh, IQ, um, IQ theories, they had, uh, had shown that it wasn't that a lot of these people were low IQ. It was just that they'd never been given the chance. They'd never been given the opportunity. They were counted out, and maybe they didn't come from money, or they had to work to support their families, and so they didn't have the opportunity for formal schooling. Right. But because of perception, because of the norms of society, they were written out, right. not given a chance, pushed away as nothing. Right. But the first step to tyranny is the us and them. Because if you can separate a group of people, then automatically you are highlighting the differences between them. Right. If you can say, you know, we're not as bad as those people over there. Then automatically there's a distinction between us and them. and them. What we're saying is we're saying that that group there has some characteristic or something that is not identifiable by us and it's not pleasing to us. It's not something that we want to defile ourselves with. So we leave that group over there and we see it time and time again as, as long as man has been around, there's always been this idea of us and them. Yeah. Those people over there, that group over there, that country, and this is why men are constantly at war. Men are always trying to up one up one another because of this us and them I'm principle. Right. Right. Why? Because this is the way we've been socialized. This is the way that we have been trained in our in our societies to, to put ourselves first, to, to take care of our group and right. our four and no more, and to promote our well-being so that we can make ourselves something. Go ahead. But I love Jesus because he didn't walk according to perception. He didn't look at what other people were saying. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes, when they saw who they heard what Jesus said and they saw what he did, in their minds there was a juxtaposition because here's this man who speaks with such authority, right. speaks with such a power, and, and is able to deliver the word in a way that no one else had done before. Right. But yet he's hanging out with publicans and with sinners. Right. With he's hanging out with them, yeah. with the unclean, with the undeserving, with the ones who have no business being in our circles because they are defiled. Because, you know, we are the holy and the righteous. We are the ones who know the word and we know the law. Thank you. We are the ones who are, are, are the religious leaders. And so we know what it means to be holy. Because we have the word. But as we heard in our Sunday school lesson, you can have the word and still be lost. You can be in the house and still be lost. You can still be in the confines of, uh, of where you're supposed to be but still be lost because you're not following after what is said. Because somehow when you start to follow your own perceptions, they, the Pharisees, they followed what they thought was right. And when Jesus came and enlightened them, they said, no, 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 this can't be right. This can't, you know, no, we know the law. How, how can you say, you know, how can you say you be of God and yet you're hanging out with, you know, don't you know who these people are? Don't you know what they've done? Don't you understand? Have you not heard? Are you new in town? Are you, are you, are you just really that dunce that you don't get it? They really came with this attitude as if, you know what? Something must be wrong with you. Because even though you come with such authority, with such power, there's just a position between what we think and what you are saying and doing. So somehow you must be wrong because we know that we're right. They came with this attitude where they could not separate what they thought from what they were seeing, even though they saw the wonders, they saw the signs, they heard the word, and yet they could not grasp it. 
they can't 